I work for the Free Software Foundation Europe, um, as you've heard. Uh, I'm the uh, UK coordinator part time, we do that three days a week. We work on stuff like, um, for instance, the upcoming changes to national, national curriculum at a national level, trying to get more free software um, into schools, trying to get more free software into local and national government, trying to get people talking about open standards um, when it comes to public money, and um, all sorts of other bits and pieces. We've got Document Freedom Day coming up at the end of this month, which is raising... Uh, raising awareness of open standards. We've got Stephen Fry on board. There's quite a few events going to be going on. So uh, check out documentfreedom.org if you're interested. Um, but yeah, so obviously, um, being from a free software foundation and the FSFE is a sister organization of the FSF in the United States, um, we've got a bit of an agenda, you might say, about free software because, for starters, we call it free software, unlike a lot of people who call it open source. Um, However, uh, hopefully, by the end of this talk, you'll see that there's a lot more agreement than disagreement amongst the, the decision makers and the people who came up with both of these terms uh, in the first place. Um, that's certainly a lot more agreement than some people um, seem to think. So, um, the next slide is coming up. <laughs> It seems like we've got a lot of choice these days um, as free software users, advocates and developers. We've got a, a plethora of, of licenses. There are something like 90 different uh, free software certified licenses um, that the OSI and the FSF are aware of. And that appears to be great um, in that people can pick and choose what they want to use. Um, businesses can make up their own modifications like, um, for instance, the Mozilla Foundation made their own license when they were deciding how to uh, release Firefox initially, and new licenses um, that qualify as free software are written every day. Um, and, you know, when you're looking at how you want to license some, some new cool stuff, you can, you can have a look and see what suits you. And um, so it, it, it appears that, as far as freedom is concerned, we, we have more choice than ever. It's, it's better supported, legally speaking. Um, but when we actually look back at the origins of most of these licenses, they, they have a, sh a common ancestor, which is not an aardvark, that's just an illustration, but um, they, uh, they, they do have a common history. As we can see, um, the GPL was uh, first announced in '86 followed by MIT in 88 and BSD in 89, with the Open Software License, which is um, the license which is created by the Open Source Initiative, um, which is the primary uh, sort of uh, lobby group, if you like, for open source as a concept. Uh, their first license was released in 2002. Um, so quite some time after the original free software license, which was copyleft. Copyleft was the original type of free software. Um, copyleft meaning that the license terms are recursive. So if you use copyleft software in a project which uh, is not copyleft, then the whole project takes under the, the same terms of the license, as most of you probably know. But so I explain that. So the, the history of both free software and open source is very firmly in um, copyleft camp, basically. And they all stem really from the work of uh, Richard Stallman and um, some legal buddies that, that he had in the mid 80s. That was actually, yeah, in response to um, uh, a threat over uh, Emacs. Somebody uh, wrote something for Emacs and refused to share it and was wanting to prosecute uh, Richard and other Emacs users because um, because they were they were using source code um, for it. So. Um, and you see right at the end here, we've got even Microsoft getting on board with their reciprocal license. So, you, you know, you can see that, you know, obviously in 86, free software was a very new concept, copyleft was brand new, and then by 2007, it was so common, um, uh, I mean, the, the Microsoft reciprocal license has copyleft elements, that's, that's the reciprocal part of it. It was so widely adopted all those years later that it was even being used by Microsoft. Um, but they all, they all stemmed um, from, from Stallman's work in 86. And um, when uh, we've got the, the, the copyleft and the copyright symbols there, um, 
Copyleft is not actually a requirement of free software. C copyleft is, is a very important concept to uh, the debate between uh, free software and, and open source, um, particularly because open source tends to be more business oriented and businesses tend to get more scared than community members when you start talking about copyleft. Because when uh, business orientated people hear you've got to do something with the licensing of the rest of your code if you use copylefted code, they think we don't have so much choice. That's, that's going to force us to do something we don't want. We don't want to give away other stuff for free. We want, we want something that's more permissive. Um, but actually, the definition of free software by the Free Software Foundation and by FSFE um, and by um, the Open Source Initiative doesn't require copyleft. So um, it's actually based on a set of four freedoms, which, which I'll uh, show in a minute. Which, which doesn't, doesn't require any recursive or viral aspect to it. So all these licenses listed here are in fact free software licenses. Um, even the Microsoft Public License is, is a free software license, um, according to both organizations. And out of 89 FSF certified free software licenses, only two of them are not also certified by uh, the OSI. Um, yeah, <laughs> those two licenses, uh, last time I checked, were NASA Open Source Agreement and the Reciprocal Public License. Those are the only two which are not guaranteed by, by both organizations to be free software. So we can see from this that when we're talking about either free software or open source, um, as, as, a, as a term, as a name, we're always referring to the same thing. I mean, names refer to objects, and these two terms, free software and open source, they refer to the same thing. They, they, they refer to software um, which uses both terms. And whatever the connotations may be, or whatever philosophy may be behind people who use one or other of those terms, what they actually refer to is, I mean, th there's no contesting the fact that they do refer to the same thing. So that gives license to people um, who want to use the terms interchangeably, um, and many people do use those terms interchangeably. Um, I don't, and neither does the FSF or FSFE, but I'll explain why. Um, a little bit later on. So, yeah, um, I'm going to get more to the, um, the significance of, of uh, the, the difference now, sort of tr begin to introduce why you might use one term rather than the other, or, or what the associated meaning has come to be. Um, this is a uh, diagram of uh, internet access in Egypt um, in January last year. And uh, it was during, you know, the, uh, the uprising, uh, Mubarak, etc. Um, and uh, basically, internet connectivity was uh, obliterated in a very short time because social networking was seen to be uh, contributing to unrest in that country. And um, the reason why I included this slide is that it, it illustrates pretty, in, in a visual way, what happens when technology uh, isn't free, essentially. When people who are in control of infrastructure um, have too much control, effectively, and the, the people who were dropped off the end of this chart, they, for the most part, would not have been aware that this was even possible when this happened. I mean, if you look at the news coverage of the time, people were shocked that it was possible for, for that to occur. Um, similarly, uh, when we look at what some law enforcement agencies are doing over uh, technology right now, we have some, some quotes here from the British government. Uh, David Cameron saying, we're working with the police, the intelligence services and industry to look at whether it would be right to stop people communicating via these websites and services when we know they are plotting violence, disorder and criminality. Well, unfortunately, David Cameron uh, nor GCHQ know when people are plotting criminality. And uh, there's no way they can ever know. And what this really means, this quote, is preemptive law enforcement. And preemptive law enforcement is generally considered to be a bad thing, people have seen Minority Report, but preemptive law enforcement isn't a threat until we have the technology in place which doesn't give the people the choice over whether to comply with that or not, or to even vote over whether it gets instigated in the first place. Um, yeah, there's a quote here about uh, a big off button for the internet, and uh, yeah, stuff about Blackberry Messenger in, in the middle of the quote there. Um, that's that's two examples of political reasons why we should be concerned about what the connotations, perhaps, of, of the freedom terms that, that we're discussing have. And uh, this is, yeah, just a, a simple list of the information that, that, that Facebook provides. 
um, when they get issued with a, a, a subpoena, or not even that, often it's just a, uh, any kind of request from law enforcement, companies like Facebook will generally comply without much uh, prompting because it's a lot easier for them to do that. Um, the laws that are made specifically in the States tend to make it uh, very much more rewarding for, for companies to comply without asking questions uh, rather than, uh, you know, making sure that... Um, but basically automatic processing of this stuff is generally what happens. So the, these are all the things that, um, for instance, uh, if, you're, if your picture is taken, uh, if you're in, a, in an area which is being occupied, like uh, uh, Manchester City Centre uh, last year when there was a, 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 an Occupy the, the, the Town Square day, uh, we were surrounded by, by cameras, people's Facebook accounts were uh, disabled the following day. Um, if, if law enforcement in, in Britain, for instance, wanted to find out about uh, what those people have been saying on their Facebook account, um, video evidence or, or uh, just of them congregating would potentially be enough for this information to be handed over. And as you can see, you know, it's IP address logs of people they've been talking to, uh, friends, lists, notes, mini feeds. Uh, I mean, Facebook even does things like calculate whether you're attractive or not in, in, in internally. Uh, some of that code was leaked last year. So, uh, I mean, Facebook's got it and the police want it, then, uh, then they'll get it. And if they can't get it legally, they'll just buy it, uh, because law enforcement is one of the biggest purchasers of um, this kind of data as well. And, uh, yeah, we've got some interesting fonts going on here. But anyway, um, yeah, this is just further examples of Gmail and Twitter letting down customers. Um, in fact, Twitter has uh, such uh, bad uh, security problems uh, over the last couple of years that they were subpoenaed by the US Department of Justice. Um, sorry, no, that's, that's, that's a separate point. Uh, um, what am I looking for here? Anyway, the Department of Justice basically required them to, um, they said, look, you, the, the degree of insecurity with your user data is illegal. You, you, need, you need to fix that. Um, and, um, yeah, G Google has, has several other privacy leaks. And again, the reason why I'm drawing attention to these in particular is that the users of these services generally don't have um, awareness that this was even a possibility when, when it happens to them. They don't, they don't realize that A, there were alternatives in the first place, um, that um, they could have had more secure services because they're not aware of things like encryption, and B, um, they, they wouldn't have thought it possible that a big company like Google often um, would, uh, would, <laughs> would have the kind of technical problems and vulnerabilities that they, they tend to have. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm going to bring this back to terminology now, and um, when we're talking about uh, free and open source, open source has, um, th is defined by the OSI as a, as a development methodology. It doesn't have any social connotations, it doesn't, it doesn't like to get involved with concepts of moral value, um, it doesn't, as a term, really make you think of any of the things in the last few slides that I've been showing you. Um, open source is something that is very uh, effective at increasing productivity um, in business sector. It's, it's a business model, um, regardless of uh, whether you care about freedom or not. It's a very effective way, often, of providing profitable services, starting a company around that. And there are lots of people in, in, you know, in Britain, uh, for instance, um, who work with open source software, who were, ended up there because that was the most profitable place to be at the time they were. And they recognised that as a professional methodology, just like agile development, for instance, um, open source is, it, it works. Um, but when we define, um, uh, when, when we define free software, um, and uh, uh, this goes for, so, so, so this is the FSF's definition of um, what something must be to be free software, which coincides with the OSI's definition, as I said earlier, but it just uses slightly different language. So the only four requirements that you, you need are um, the freedom to run the program, the freedom to study how it works, the freedom to redistribute copies, um, and uh, the freedom to distribute modified copies. Uh, so that's derivative works. And uh, so long as uh, those four freedoms are adhered to, and as I say, there's no copy left in there, right? So, so long as those four freedoms are adhered to, then, then it's both free software um, and more or less open source. There are actually seven points in the OSI's definition, but they, they coincide with the same thing, as I illustrated earlier with the 89 licenses, two of them uh, being out of agreement. Uh, and this is actually, um, 
the, this is Bruce Perrins, who was the co-founder of the Open Source Initiative. He was one of the people uh, who, who uh, came up with the, with the concept of open source in the first place. He was the person who published the announcement of uh, the Open Source Marketing Initiative, um, and he you know, is key to the whole concept, the, the origins of the open source movement. And we have an interesting quote here. He was being interviewed by um, Shane, who uh, until last year was FSFE's legal coordinator. Um, he said, I think it's really a difference in marketing. Suppose you're selling vacuum cleaners. Well, sometimes you want to tell people this is cheap because they have a limited budget. And sometimes you want to tell people this will clean well because that's their biggest priority. So we're really talking about tailoring a message to the audience. So as you can see here, th th this is his explanation of the difference between free versus open. The actual interview is entitled free versus open. And we have the founder of open source really as a concept saying here that it's a marketing term and it's used to help differentiate the benefits of free software to different groups of people. And he's using the, the, the vacuum cleaner here to obviously illustrate different people's needs. Um, he, he goes on to add here that early in the days of free software, one of the important at that time players felt that Richard Stallman personally would scare business people and that open source would surmount and replace the free software campaign. That's in terminology rather than anything else. I think. That was a mistake. And the most important thing about that is that it's over. So we are talking about the same thing when we say open source and free software. Um, so, I mean, as I say, he's saying that the, if there was conflict between these two terms, it was early on in the movement and it was over personalities rather than the meaning of the term. Um, and according to him, it's over. So uh, I think that's quite significant. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I now have a couple of slides about um, the effect that, um, again, the, the, the effect of, of the lack of choice of, of these licenses can have on uh, particularly third sector. So, um, yeah, what, what I want to highlight here basically is that we, for instance, in this room, we have a lot of knowledge. Even if we're not technical people here, the mere fact that we are here means that we're aware of choices um, that the vast majority of people aren't. And the decisions that we make uh, have a big impact on, potentially, on um, other people in society um, and on all sorts of things, um, including, for instance, uh, things like uh, where tax is spent on, uh, on technology. And if you imagine a, a pyramid, we're basically at the top in terms of the choice that we have and the, the view that we have of the top, from the top of that pyramid. We can see, we can see um, for instance, that we can use alternatives to Facebook. Many people here will have heard of Diaspora. Um, we can see that we can use an operating system which doesn't spy on us and which we have a degree of trust in because we know people who understand how it works. Even if we don't understand how it works ourselves, um, I think everybody in this room knows somebody who could install Fedora or something on their computer for them. And that is actually a really significant thing. Because if you don't have awareness that that's possible, then you can never make that choice. And you can never choose to find out how to do that yourself or to make the contacts that would allow you to, to do something like replace your operating system. Um, we're aware of encryption. I mean, we know, we, I think everybody in this room probably has a concept of what that, that term really means. And also that, that it, it's possible for people like us to use it. Again, maybe, maybe we're not all actually interested or technically savvy enough to use it ourselves. But, but just the awareness of that and, and you know, the fact that, that we probably know how to help ourselves by finding that information, we kind of know where to look, um, that is really enormously significant. Because people who get all their information about the technology and where to place their trust, for instance, what kind of smartphone phone vendor, um, what email client to use, people who, who, who get their information from a retailer, for instance, they never get that choice. And when the first time that those people actually realize that maybe they did have a choice or maybe um, they should have looked at alternatives is when their service fails them. Uh, like in the cases that I illustrated earlier with 
Gmail, uh, Twitter privacy problems, Facebook handing over details. Um, and that's too late, really, you know, I, I mean, that, 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 that really is. And, and it's, it's too late because um, by the time people realise en masse, there will already be something waiting for them often to jump into next, or we may not have the right platform ready for them by that time to migrate to that, that does protect their freedom because not enough of us have chosen to use it in the intervening period and we haven't put enough support behind it. Um, so, for instance, if Facebook um, had some bigger privacy scare tomorrow than they've had up to this point, and everybody, I mean, everybody was looking for alternatives, would we as a free software community be able to provide them with, um, uh, with something that would really viably replace that service for them, that wouldn't, you know, crash under the load, that, you know, wouldn't have so many bugs that be exploited really quickly and, and all that kind of stuff? Um, I don't know, maybe we would. But we, as people at the top of that pyramid of knowledge, um, I think to an extent we have a responsibility to, to use um, that information that we have to make informed decisions that we know will end up affecting other people at some point in future. Because, as I say, by the time other people are in a position to make that decision, it will be too late for them. Um, whatever, it will be too late in that they will have been let down. And it might be significant. Because, you know, people go to jail when these services let them down. Um, there were some teenagers last month um, who received a jail term for starting a Facebook group in Scotland called something like Riot in the Toon. And without any description of potential vandalism, as I understand it, just the existence of the group and the fact that people joined that was enough for them to be interviewed by police. I mean, that, that is scary to me. And, and we need to, to have alternatives for people that, that allow them to, to, to move before that kind of situation develops. Now, how what I've just been saying relates to free versus open source, I think, is it means it, it's clear in that, um, in that when we talk about open source as a methodology, we miss all of the, the, the impact that, um, that it has on society, effectively. When we use the term open source, in my view, we choose to highlight a certain subset of the freedoms that free software provides to us. Because ultimately, it's all about freedom, right? The reason why free software is useful um, to community groups and the reason why open source software is useful to business people um, is that it provides freedom to different degrees. It's the same freedom that allows my company, hypothetically speaking, to provide um, services uh, at a profit for something like MySQL or um, free software, routing software, whatever. Um, it's, it's the same freedom that gives me the opportunity to profit from it in, in a business setting as benefits me as a citizen, ultimately. The freedom to uh, alter software to my particular business needs, to localize open office to whatever Scandinavian tax law, is, is a, it, it's, the same, it's the same root, that freedom, that means that I can... I can make sure that Open Office works with my disability, or that it supports my relatives which um, need to use um, speech recognition software because they've got repetitive strain injury or something like that. It's, it's the same freedom, it's just labelled differently depending on the setting. And if we forget about all the benefits that that freedom has to society um, by um, focusing on the, the more practical benefits that it has to business, then I think we lose the most, um, the most exciting part and the most important part um, of, of the whole movement, really. Um, because ultimately, it's, it's the same business people who are going to be worried about their privacy when they're on YouPorn and um, the chat services uh, outsourced to a third party, which releases the IP addresses and username and passwords of everybody who's ever used it, which happened, uh, again, last month, I believe. Um, of course, you know, those are proprietary systems. Had they been free software systems, maybe they would have been hacked too. But at least there would have been more opportunity to do something about it. At least nobody else would have been hacked. Um, uh, at least, <laughs> at least um, the website in question would have a wide choice of uh, opportunities to, to fix that problem quickly or fix it in-house. Um, but, um, yeah, so, um, so, so the root is freedom. <laughs> Is, is basically what I'm saying, and um, yeah, what what this some of the statistics on this slide uh, are, are about is um, 
basically how, for instance, um, sectors like the third sector, uh, charity sector, um, they end up being very restricted in the decisions that they can make because of the kinds of decisions that people like us make. Um, because when it's possible for um, a director of uh, systems at um, Save the Children to say, there is nobody in this company who has ever used open document format. There is nobody here who has ever used LibreOffice or OpenOffice. When he can say that truthfully, then the buying decisions for people further down the tree are very limited. And, and, and the buying decisions for, for managers in this organisation and people who are involved in the procurement are also very limited. And it becomes a, uh, a cyclical effect because um, we, uh, if we don't make ourselves visible enough as people who do make these choices and who do cho choose to focus on the freedom aspects um, of the free software movement, then further down the line uh, it will end up that people who, who don't have the choice will have these things uh, foisted upon them. And again, this, this happens time and time again uh, in, in society. Things like submitting your tax returns in the UK. You have to use proprietary software. It doesn't support GNU Linux. Well, why not? Because nobody uses GNU Linux. Because that's open source. And it's not to do with freedom, it's a development methodology, right? Um, at least that's what people argue. I mean, you know, the kind of arguments um, that are made against the use of free software, and against the use of open source for that matter, are usually made behind closed doors. They're not, we're not invited to the table as a community, because we're busy being eaten, basically. Um, we don't have our opinion heard. Um, it's, it's, you know, it, it, it's important, basically, whether we have visibility, whether we have visibility as users, whether we have, whether we have visibility of, um, of the applications that we use. Um, and unfortunately, having forums with, you know, whatever, 10 million posts doesn't count when it comes to a cabinet office meeting as to whether there's uh, enough support or awareness or um, familiarity with the product for it to be rolled out in um, the Department for Work and Pensions, for instance, which is about to trial a thousand free software desktops, allegedly. Um, so, um, yeah, again, the trickle-down effect is that choice tends to dry up, and, and it starts at the top, uh, and we're at the top um, in terms of the awareness and, and the choices that, that we have. Um, this, again, is, is an example of a Microsoft license donations um, policy. Uh, this, I think, it certainly applies to the UK, and I think it's a, a pan-European thing. But you can see on the right that, um, that I mean, the, the charities who end up making decisions about whether or not to use open source, as they think of it, um, they are completely inel ineligible for any kind of donation, uh, as far as software goes, if they are a healthcare organisation, for instance, or um, if they're an educational institution. They're, they're, they, they have a separate set of uh, you know, uh, discounts and regulations uh, for that, depending on whether you're, you're public or private. But, but by default, these lists on the right, um, they just aren't covered. So those organisations, they're spending money on proprietary software. They're spending money on the stuff that we might choose not to use. Um, but we, uh, um, <laughs> when we say... Uh, when we say we're using something because it's open source or that we're, we're, we're using it um, and it happens to be open source, um, just maybe think about the fact that not highlighting the freedom aspects of that means that further down the line, um, those fundraisers that go knocking door to door, there's going to be a lot more of them out there paying for licenses for a lot longer and renewing them every two years because two years is the maximum cycle that any entitlement lasts on, on the, the Microsoft uh, donor program. And as it says at the bottom here, a maximum of five server products, regardless of group, are, are eligible no matter how big the organization is. And you might think five server products is a lot, but that doesn't necessarily mean five different applications. That might mean five different insta installations um, of a, um, uh, for instance, uh, Microsoft uh, 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 database system or something like that. So yeah. And yeah, to, to, to try and clarify, um, why we at the FSF use um, free software as a term rather than open source. These are basically the, the bullet points. We find it it's easier to understand because although free is ambiguous in English, um, it is clearer uh, once people understand the concept of freedom 
than any other of the, the terms that are available. Libra says a lot less to somebody in the street than freedom software, in my experience. Um, it's also not just English that we have to worry about, bear in mind. Uh, many European languages have two words for free. And especially if you think, well, um, most people in Europe, their native language isn't English. And most people in Europe, um, they can choose between having a term that means literally free as in freedom, like Libra, um, in their own language, rather than gratis, or they can have something which is a technical term, like open source. I mean, we would much rather have the freedom connotation, because apart from anything else, these kind of people, that's why they're involved in it. Uh, and again, that's where the movement came from, as I illustrated earlier. Um, second of all, free software uh, as a term is harder to abuse, um, in as much as open source Originally, um, the, the idea was it was going to be um, it was going to be a trademark of sorts. It was going to be only usable if you applied for a license from the open source initiative, and that failed um, because the term was seen to be too descriptive. And as a result, open source it's a bit like cloud computing. It, it doesn't necessarily mean anything. Uh, you can put open source as a label on anything you like. Uh, I can call myself an open source boy. I, I can wear a T-shirt saying that. Um, and lots of companies do abuse it. I mean, there's new startups every single day which have open source as a statement somewhere on their website. But what they really mean is that um, often, you know, it's, it's trialware, uh, for instance. And there's very little freedom involved in trialware. Um, uh, so free software, I mean, it really includes the concept of freedom in it um, as a term. And it, it's harder for, for you to put free software on, uh, as a label on a product um, if, uh, if, it, if it doesn't meet the four freedoms um, and if it doesn't contain freedom. I mean, apart from anything else, any layperson can say, there's not much freedom in that product. It doesn't feel free to me, so yeah. Um, <laughs> and also, free software is better defined than open source. It's been around longer. There's more definitions. There's definitions in most languages on Earth of free software. Um, one of the great things about free software is that it can be translated, it can be localized, and this is, you know, a key part of um, the freedoms involved. It can be adapted to people's needs. And also the definition has been translated. And it's actually a lot harder to, to translate the concept of open source um, amongst a group of people who aren't familiar with the technical details of it. Whereas freedom, um, freedom as a concept exists in most languages, certainly a lot more than a development methodology. Um, also, uh, free software provides uh, additional value. Basically, it, it just it, it connotes those the, the, the moral value of freedom that, that I've been have been discussing. It, it's more encompassing um, in the con in the concepts that it brings to mind. It's not a subset. It's it's the, the set as a whole. Um, so within the concept of free software is the concept of the freedom to do business, however you like. It's the freedom to use it in military settings, uh, if you so wish. The freedom to extend it regardless of competition. It includes all those freedoms in the concept. And, yeah, finally, it, it offers freedom in the word itself. Um, that is the end of my slides. Um, I uh, did have some more, but now I don't. So, um, I will uh, take some questions, if anyone's got any.